Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. My name is Patrick Odellini. I am the Chief Resilience Officer and Director of Earthquake Safety for the City and County of San Francisco. And this is an information about the recently passed private school evaluation ordinance. And specifically, we're going to be talking about what's required in the ordinance and walk you through some of the steps. Uh, when I'm finished, we'll have time to do some question and answers. Uh, so there's a microphone right up here. So when we're done with the presentation, feel free to line up. And we're happy to talk about any issues that, that you guys are concerned about. Um, Restrooms are right around the corner, and uh, as I said before, we have coffee and cookies in the back, so feel free to help yourself. Um, so uh, many of you have seen this report that's up here on the screen. Um, this, was a, this report was the product of almost three years at this point uh, of work that was put into looking at our city's private schools. Um, we've known for a long time that the state and the city has treated private and public schools differently. Um, that's not an accusation that private schools are unsafe. It just means they've been regulated differently in the past. Um, private schools are, are essential to San Francisco. Uh, about one in three children, about 24,000 kids, are educated in San Francisco's private schools. Um, so we know that not only is this uh, an important part for our children's safety to make sure we're looking at these things, but we also know that after a major disaster, Getting these schools back up and running is going to be essential to the recovery of San Francisco. Um, you can't have education in San Francisco if we're not engaging the private schools. Uh, so this is something that when we think about long-term resiliency, when you think about being able to, to get back to work, to put your kids in school, to get back to life as normal after a tragic situation like a catastrophic earthquake. Um, starting in the 30s, that's when we started thinking about the public schools differently. Um, after the, what you're seeing here is damage from the Long Beach earthquake in 1933. And after that, that's when the state passed the Field Act, and that's when we began taking steps to make sure that our public schools were properly funded for seismic safety. Um, when we began talking about this about a year and a half ago, um, the conversation was started around what do we do? And we looked at all of these different policy interventions. Uh, one of the interventions could simply be mandatory retrofit, make all the schools retrofit by a deadline. Um, the other end of that spectrum could be do an information program. Uh, we know information programs are great, but they're not really effective at causing change and actually changing the way we think and do things. They don't change behavior. On the other end of that spectrum, as I mentioned, mandatory retrofit, we know that schools, especially the private schools, come in all shapes and sizes, all different levels of revenue, and if we were to treat them all the same and require a retrofit by a deadline, we know we would see schools close, and that certainly isn't what we want to do with this effort here. So eventually, after a lot of long discussion, uh, we decided to meet in the middle. We decided to do an evaluation. So that's all that's required under this ordinance is the school do a seismic evaluation. So that way the school community has the tools that they need to make informed decisions about their risk. Um, the chart you see up in front of me is kind of an explanation of that. Um, it's not actually looking at specific schools. It's looking at schools in general, looking at the types of schools that were there, whether they were concrete buildings, wood frame buildings. In the approximate year, that usually gives us a pretty good indication of how it will perform in an earthquake. So if you see here on the, the pie chart on the right, there's a large part there where it's striped, that 24%. There was a huge part of this that we just didn't understand. Again, kind of reinforcing the idea of coming in and doing an evaluation for this. So those of you, I realize that we have a mix here of, of engineers, of contractors, of school administrators. So I'm going to talk at a level that, that hopefully everybody can follow me on. And it's going to be a little bit about building code occupancy. Uh, and we're happy to explain this a little further as we go on. But essentially, schools under the building code are considered an E occupancy. Um, every kind of building, every kind of use has its own classification. And that's how schools are categorized in the code. Um, because of that, we want to make sure that it's a really easy place to start. So we're going to start by evaluating all e-occupancies. Now, schools are complex. Sometimes schools have a church associated with them. Sometimes there's a residential occupancy associated with them. Those types of buildings are not intended to be evaluated under this ordinance. So after a lot of months of careful negotiation and working with the stakeholders, uh, actually a group of over 450 of you, that's probably how you found out about this this evening, um, have been able to give us a lot of input and really create some framework so people are comfortable moving forward. So a lot of people ask me, are there exemptions to the evaluation requirement? And yes, and it's also replicated in the San Francisco Building Code. And all of this information, before I forget, is also available on our website. Um, but there's three different exemptions for the evaluation. The evaluation is not required for buildings occupied by 25 or more persons for less than 12 hours per week or four hours in any given day. 
Um, this actually draws on a previous building code reference uh, to what e-occupancy used to be considered. But when we were working with the stakeholders, this was expressed as a great way to give definitive framework on the hours of use in this building and whether or not it should be evaluated. The second exemption is if you have 25 or fewer students. Um, it's not to say that we're not concerned about the safety of these students, um, but when we're looking at the overall risk and the impact on the city, um, it starts to get into a complicated space. So it was agreed universally that schools with 25 or fewer students enrollment averaged over three years should not be required to evaluate. Um, evaluation is also not required uh, for buildings that are not cl classified as a group E occupancy. You heard me mention churches or accessory residential buildings. These are the type of buildings that are exempt from the evaluation process. So there's two things that are required. The law went into effect of November in 2014. In the next 12 months, by November of next year, there's a scope report. That's what's required to be submitted. Um, that it can be completed by a school administrator. Uh, we recommend that if you work with a design professional that you should be in cult consultation with them because some of this does get on the fringe of being technical, but it's not intended to be a technical document. Um, this gives you a chance to look at the buildings on your campus and say, okay, we think that this, based on the requirements of the ordinance, meets this definition and these are the buildings that are going to be evaluated. We also know very clearly from those parameters that I gave you there's going to be some buildings that are not going to be evaluated. This is our chance to have that conversation. Um, if there's any you know, curiosity as to what, a, what is subject to it and what is not, we're happy to help. Um, we have a very diverse team made up of urban planners, of building code experts, policy experts, and engineers. And while we wouldn't do the evaluation for you, uh, we'd be able to come out and set you up for success. That's our goal here. So as I mentioned, there's basically these two items, the scope report and the seismic evaluation. I'm going to walk you through the scope document so you have an idea of what this looks like and what's required. Um, at the top part, it's basically announcing the, the building code section and telling you a little bit about the instructions on what you would do. Uh, you heard me mention that this is a free document to submit. There's no cost to you from the city. Um, as we go through it, you'll start to see some other things. Um, you heard me mention the deadline for submitting the scope document is November 2nd, 2015. Uh, if, if for some reason a document is not submitted by then, um, if, it's, if it's a complicated issue where things are happening, please let us know ahead of time. We may be able to work with you, but in theory, if you do not submit that, the billing department will issue you a notice of violation for noncompliance if you don't do it by November 2nd. Um, we have an email address, quakesafeschools at sfgov.org. Um, that's the best way to reach us if you have any questions or would like us to do a site visit. And then once this is completed, you can actually send the PDF to us. You don't have to send us a hard copy. However, some people like to do that, so you have the option. If you'd prefer, you can mail us a copy as well. Um, again, don't worry too much about the address and things like that. It'll all be available on our website as well. So the forms are available in two locations. They're available on our website, which is sfgov.org backslash ESIP, and they're also available on the Department of Building Inspections website. It's actually part of an administrative bulletin. So there's an administrative bulletin for the private schools, uh, again, on, on the website, which will walk you through the process, and then it has both templates attached. Uh, we know that most engineers, when it comes to the evaluation report, are actually going to prefer to use the template, because it's in a Word doc, and it's very simple to use, and very simple, very user-friendly. We don't see, think we'll see a lot of these being handwritten. So um, as you go through here, for the first section is, ha it, does this report replace another existing report, yes or no? Uh, we know that sometimes a scope document will come in. It might be filled out incorrectly. We're willing to work with you and make sure it's done right. But if you send it in a second time, we want you to be able to document that. Um, section one is really just the administrative information. We want to know the school name, the school address, and more importantly, the block and lot number. Um, addresses are very complicated in San Francisco. So we tend to rely on a block and lot map, which is a little more reliable and a little more consistent. Some of you schools may be on multiple lots. That's okay. Please give us the lot number so we can accurately assess the size and scope of this. Um, section two is the contact information. Um, so this could be whoever you want your point person to be. Uh, this could be the person who's head of facilities for the school. This could be the principal. This could be someone from the board. It, it doesn't matter who you pick as long as it's the person who's correctly identified as the responsible person for the project. Section three, um, again, just kind of repeating the school name on top. Who knows, sometimes papers get separated and we don't want to lose your evaluation. Now, one of the things that people ask me is resources. You know, how, how are we going to find this? Um, as I mentioned, some schools have their contractors, have their architects, have their engineers, and never change them. That's fine. You can use anybody who's licensed in the state of California. But for those of you who have never done this project before, uh, we actually have a comprehensive resource list. We've worked with the Structural Engineers Association of Northern California. Um, they've surveyed all their members, so those of you 
you who are not familiar with Seonk, it's a nonprofit for structural engineers, and they've surveyed all their members that specialize in this type of work. So they've provided a resource list. We've also put together a resource list of all of the engineers that the San Francisco Unified School District has used for both retrofit and evaluation. Um, so between those sources, there's several names to be able to call. All of that is posted on our website, once again, at www.sfgov.org backslash ESIP, ESIP. Uh, stands for Earthquake Safety Implementation Program. So um, I think with that, um, I'd love to try to move into some Q&A so in case there's any questions out there. So just to make sure we get the audio and everybody can hear, um, I'd love for you guys to please come up to the microphone and, and we're happy to take any questions at this time. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Paul Galvin, San Francisco Friends School. Will the scope report be used by the city to determine whether we need to have the evaluation done or are we just simply expected to have the evaluation done? That's one question. And the second question is, schools that have been, that have had major seismic retrofitting in the, let's say the last 10 years, will they be exempt from the get-go or will they still need to have the evaluation done? That's an excellent question. And, and actually, as, as a point of contact, I mean, maybe I should have explained this in the beginning. Um, I've been working with the city now for, for almost three years. Uh, prior to that, I was a building code consultant that helped people deal with these, these issues here in San Francisco. So I've had the privilege of working with schools such as SI, Friends School, and many others as they went through the re renovation process. So I happen to know, since, since Friends School did a major seismic retrofit several years ago, um, the work has mostly been done. Um, you know, you, you already have a very safe building. Uh, I've seen that giant moment frame that's in your entryway as you walk in. So, so actually doing the engineering evaluation would be fairly simple because you already have access to existing plans and existing calculations. So the engineer that originally designed that should be able to do that very quickly, very easily. Um, that's an important point too. If any of your schools have done recent structural work, try to get those plans available. Um, I would also recommend if you had a good relationship with that engineer, use that engineer. Um, feel free to use whoever you want, but if you have plans, if you have all this information, that's gonna make their job easier and reduce the cost for you. Hi, I'm Greg Hilton, I'm with the Stern School. Um, we're, we're, our high school is um, in a church. We have more than 25 students, they're full time. So is that something we need to evaluate? Yeah, um, without seeing the documents on that school, I would assume that at some point there was a permit, a building permit applied for to either change the use or have that use as a school in addition to the church, so it would be an e-occupancy. Um, to give you an idea of how that would work, if you said we didn't want to evaluate that church, you would have to find another location to have that schooling take place. So as long as the kids are there and it's primarily used for education, it's evaluated. So is it a single building? So yeah, it would be the whole building. It would be the whole building. Mm -hmm. Not part of the evaluation. So for those of you who didn't hear the question was, uh, is, is ADA or any disabled access uh, triggered as a result of evaluation? No, not as a result of evaluation. That said, if you choose to do a retrofit, just like any building permit in a commercial space, there is requirements under Chapter 11B of the building code that have to be complied with. Sorry to keep coming back to this. Um, <clears throat> so our school is in a church. We don't own the church. Mm -hmm. We're renting space. Who's responsible for this program? That's an excellent question. We do have several schools in San Francisco that are owned by somebody else and leased by the school. Building code language is always passive and assumes that the owner is the ultimate responsible party. That said, it's always a little complicated on who's responsible when you talk about the lease terms. Um, the simple way to talk about it is the owner is responsible. But they need to obviously work in conjunction with the school. Um, and so that's why, uh, and I forgot to point that out when we were having some slide problems here, but on the, on the first page of the scope document, it actually gives you some, uh, some spaces and some options to, to identify that, to say the school is owned by this person, uh, we are the tenant, and between those two parties decide who the contact person is, and that's the person we will use as a liaison. Just curious, how physically you think retrofitting? Because during the school year, you know, contractors cannot do the job. So basically, it's only during the summertime. Mm -hmm. So summertime, it's like a two months if you don't have a summer school. So during two months, are you supposed to finish the retrofitting or are you just doing part of the retrofitting and do the school year and the next summer you do it again and again and again until you're done? Or how do you actually propose logistics? So I think it's important to note that the, any retrofitting is completely voluntary. 
not required by this ordinance. That said, if a school chooses to, it's completely up to them how they want to schedule it because there's no deadline, there's no requirement. If they want to do it in phases, they're more than welcome to. If they want to do it all at once, they're more than welcome to. Okay. I have two questions. If San Francisco Unified School District owns a property and leases the building to a private school, since it's not in your is it in your jurisdiction? So the simple way to talk about that, and I think there's a couple of examples that fall into that case. Um, we see this a lot with charter schools. Yes. Sometimes charter schools are located in U.S. Uh, in San Francisco Unified School District owned buildings. If DSA is, this, is the authority having jurisdiction, they are not required to follow the San Francisco Building Code. That's the simple way to think about it. If it's something where the local building department has jurisdiction over the property, they are required because they are subject to the San Francisco Building Code. Is there a way to hide as a charter school because they're on school district property and not go through DSA? That's an interesting one. Um, almost every, I haven't seen a case like that. Are you working on a school that has that situation? No, I, I just thought it, it probably does come up where they squeeze through the crack. <laughs> yeah, no, and for the most part, anecdotally, if it's on, if it's on unified district property, um, it's probably DSA oh, uh, okay. in almost every case. Mm -hmm. um, the second question I have is, you mentioned that when we go through the retrofit, we'll have to comply with the ADA requirements. But I know there's a lot of private schools out there that are very old. We're gonna be going through preservation also, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Correct. Mm -hmm. And that, we did SI and that was a trial. But mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to let people know that when they get to that stage, it's a full review by the building department and all the different parts of the building department. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, and I think, I think that's a perfect inject to talk about the case management. So what we want to do, and I mentioned this earlier, is we want to set you up for success. So if you're planning on doing a construction project, let's have that conversation. Uh, we did that with St. Ignatius, and we tried to make them aware of things that would be triggered by other departments, things that they're not thinking about. You know, hey, did you think about energy compliance? Well, if you do this part in your scope of work, you're going to trigger that. Hey, did you think about accessibility? Because if you do this here, it's going to trigger X, Y, and Z. That's what we want to be able to do to provide value to you as a school. Uh, we want to be able to walk you through that and give you an idea of what's required because construction is expensive and complicated. We know that. Downtime for schools is a really hard thing to cope with. So what we're trying to do is minimize all of the downtime and maximize all the benefit as you go in for a building permit. Um, for those of you who are concerned about, about historic review, I think that's a very real issue. I think if you're doing any exterior work voluntarily to the building, then you should think about what the planning department is going to say and have a conversation with the planning department. We actually have an interagency working group. Um, this was part of our promise to the schools uh, as we were going through the legislative process. So we've identified one key person in every city department that has anything to do with the plan check process. So we're talking about city planning, Department of Building Inspection, San Francisco Fire Department, SFPUC, and everybody else that touches it, DPW, um, and so as you go through that, we have point people in each one of those departments. Again, it's on our website with the list of resources from the engineering community. Um, these are the right people to talk to. Um, but we also recommend if you have general questions, start with us. Uh, we're happy to do that and happy to make those connections and those referrals. The last thing we want you to do is be calling a number and get passed around to 17 people. Um, that's not good enough. We want to give you superior service and we want to make sure that you're set up. So one, one quick question, and I uh, apologize to the rest of the audience because this is a technical question. This might be more of a question for you, David. Um, but I uh, was curious about the private school's evaluations form, um, whether it recognizes the, the benchmark exemptions from ASC 41, so, or do we, does, do we, are we still required to fill out the entire evaluation form if it's a benchmark building? My name is David Bonowitz. I'm a structural engineer. I was a consultant to ESIP in helping to put together the program. The answer is yes. The engineering criteria for the evaluation are as a national standard called ASCE 41. You get the advantages that come with ASCE 41. One of those is that relatively new buildings are benchmarked structurally. Non-structural not, structural yes. So that also goes to the question of those who have done recent retrofits. If you've done a retrofit that satisfies what's called the life safety standard in ASCE 41, you can use that also to benchmark and be done. Uh, we talked about uh, the possibility of triggering ADA um, issues. 
What about Title 24? Title 24 energy compliance? Yeah. Title 24 energy compliance is usually triggered on a couple of things. Um, you would trigger envelope compliance of the building, so the way your building actually retains energy, if you touch the exterior glazing of the building. So if you're basically changing any openings in the structure, that's something you'd want to consider. Um, the other time you would trigger that is basically any time you're touching that system. So for example, if you start touching lighting, that's going to trigger Tile 24 energy compliance for your lighting system. It's usually very localized, so it wouldn't be building wide, um, but definitely work with the right consultant on that. Same thing goes for your mechanical systems. Small family daycares and large family daycares come under this retrofit situation in a family daycare of one unit, single family, or two unit, four unit buildings where large and small day family daycares. So for those of you who didn't hear the question, it was about small family daycares. Uh, those are not intended to be under the ordinance, and there's a couple of different examples on how a building like that would opt out. Um, first of all, uh, say, say the kind of at-home daycare where it's a single family home and someone's watching several children, that is not an e-occupancy most of the time, almost always. So therefore, right off the bat, it wouldn't be required. There's also a subsequent requirement that if it's less than 25 children enrolled, no requirement to evaluate. So in every case, it seems like the situation you're presenting would not be required to, unless it was a really large daycare or something along those lines. Well, if I don't see anybody else lining up, I, I think we will go ahead and conclude. Um, you know, thank you all very much for coming. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a, a list of engineers over here, but it's really just a prompt if you want to look at it. It's also available on our website. Uh, we're going to take the recording from tonight and reproduce that on our website so it can be available 24 hours a day. Uh, we realized uh, that we are hosting us on a Friday night of a three-day weekend. So thank you very much for taking the time to show up. And uh, we are here and available to help with any other questions or, or any other services that you guys might need as you go through this process. So thank you very much for attending tonight.